Hi. 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 It's great to see all you. <laughs> the best part of my job is talking to librarians and asking them, what do you guys want to give for the holidays? And what do you want to <coughs> get? Um, I'm going to start with you, sir. Yes. Can you tell us a little about you and your collection? Well, I'm Tim Johnson, and I'm the uh, curator of special collections and rare books, and also the E.W. McDermott, curator of the Sherlock Holmes collection. So I get to <laughs> I get to work with a lot of cool stuff. I see a lot of cool stuff, day in and day out, um, and new stuff that comes across my desk or that you pass through the window to me. I went to the Heartland Festival and met a local author, a mystery writer, and I was in the middle of reading piles and piles of kids' books, and I said, hey, Tim, could you give these a try? Yeah, and it's, it's Jess Lowry, um, the Murder by Month mystery. Um, mm -hmm. And her character, Mira James, is it's interesting, because um, a young woman who's been studying English at the university here, works as a waitress in a Vietnamese restaurant, lives in an apartment on the West Bank, and is just kind of tired of it all and wants to get away from the city. So she ends up in Ottertail County in this uh, little town, Battle Lake, and she finds a job kind of interim in the public library as a librarian, and then uh, also as a reporter on the local paper. And uh, <clears throat> murders <laughs> start to happen <laughs> and so it's a murder by month and so uh, you have May Day and January Thaw and she's got got one for almost every month. She's not done with the entire series yet. Um, part of what attracted me was that she grew up in Painesville which is where I was born and so I thought well this is kind of cool let me read uh, what Jess has got to say about uh, kind of rural Minnesota and so you get that that kind of outstate feel, um, and you get some local history woven into the stories. Uh, there's a Civil War thread that f works its way into one of the one of the mysteries, and they're just they're they're a lot of fun. Um, you know, you're out on the lake in the winter, ice fishing, and uh, with all the guys, you know, and their cans of beer and talking about fish and. There's a body that shows up, so, um, yeah. So, so, so they're, they're more of a light, cozy, <coughs> in that sense? Yeah, um, somewhere, somewhere in the cozy, or... But, but aside from as, the murder. Not as, not as dark <laughs> as P.J. Tracy. No, no. I mean, kind of what they reminded me of a little bit was M.D. Lake's um, series that he did with... Uh, Peggy O'Neill, the campus cop here at the university. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's got that kind of a feel to so it, but it's but it's transplanted out into Ottertail County and Battle Lake, and and uh, so it's a it's a different kind of universe, uh, um, and I think a welcome change for Mira James from her waitressing job on the West Bank. So that's one local author. Yeah. Did you another another one that came my way. Um, and actually a member of the faculty here at the U, mm. Julie Schumacher. Did you guys read this book? Not yet. It, it no. is this laugh is, out This loud is funny. a hoot. Um, um, it keeps showing up on the blogs I read, though. Mm. <laughs> There's yeah. a reason for that. Uh, this, uh, the character Jason Fitker, who's this kind of beleaguered professor who's always being pestered for letters of recommendation. Uh, from students, some of whom he's maybe met for five seconds. They've never been in his class, um, but he ends up writing all of these different letters of recommendation for students, for colleagues, uh, and and Julie uses those letters as a way to tell his his story. Um, so you learn some things about him uh, and his life as a as a frustrated uh, creative writing professor at this unnamed. Midwestern University. Um, <laughs> the um, large wink, Midwestern wink. University. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the, it's, it's a hoot. I mean, yeah, he's writing these letters uh, uh, and they kind of go into this administrative abyss. I mean, <laughs> he has some great ways of, of tweaking colleagues, administrators, deans. <laughs> as he's writing these letters of recommendation. So is it, is so it just for faculty members to read, or do you no. think anyone could identify? I mean, obviously anybody who's in higher ed, I think, is going to be delighted by the book. Um, but I think anybody who wants to kind of get inside the mind of a 
of a creative writing professor or a professor at a university. It's a really interesting insight. And so I think it has a broad, broad appeal. Tim? Yes. What's the name of the book? Dear committee <laughs> members, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Who's it by? It's Julie Schumacher. I did mention Julie oh, earlier, okay. but yeah, dear committee members, uh, it uh, highly recommended. Uh, a lot of fun to read. And then I'm going to throw out one other local author um, who's written a number of things. I think a lot of people know him through his Lost Twin Cities work. Uh, and I'm speaking of Larry Millette. Uh, who wrote an architectural column for the Pioneer Press for many years and then did the books on the Lost Twin Cities and the TV programs uh, on the same theme. But he also did a series of books that bring Sherlock Holmes to Minnesota. And this is an older one in the series. It's Sherlock Holmes and the Ice Palace Murders. But I wanted to mention this one in particular because Park Square Theater is going to be doing uh, an adaptation of this uh -huh. uh, book um, and um, Peter Moore is going to be directing it. Uh, it's going to be sometime in 2015. I'm not sure of the exact date. Um, but there are six or seven, I think, books that Larry's written now that bring Sherlock Holmes uh, to Minnesota, along with Dr. Watson. Um, obviously, the person who's paying for their services is the most wealthy man in the state, James J. Hill. So they stay at the Hill House whenever they're around. Um, but they're a lot of fun, and Larry weaves in a lot of local and state history uh, into the different stories. So obviously, this one deals with the Winter Carnival in St. Paul. Obviously. Obviously. <laughs> the, I, the Ice Palace murders. So um, uh, so that's my, th my third pick uh, from a local author. I think people will really, really enjoy Larry's, Larry's work. Oh, thank you, Tim. Yeah. Can you introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about your collection? Yeah. Well, I'm Carolyn Bischoff, and I... Um, and the physics and earth sciences librarian, I work in the science and engineering library. Um, so I brought a few, a few books for people who, who have a variety of interests, so history of science to people who just like to work with their hands. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there's actually one book I couldn't bring, which was, um, it's called The Science of Interstellar by Kip Thorne. Um, and this was, this was a movie that I saw fairly recently and was so cool. I think I, don't, I think this is going to be on a lot of Christmas lists this season because Interstellar was such an interesting movie, um, and there was a lot of news about it when it first came out about how the the physics in the movie was so um, was based on real life and not just on a special effects artist's whim. Um, <laughs> um, I saw Neil deGrasse Tyson tweeting about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. It's interesting. So I um, I follow a lot of uh, physicists and cosmologists because of my job, and it's funny how the physicists were very excited about interstellar. This is so cool and interesting, and all the cosmologists were just like, "Oh no!" <laughs> 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 they had a very different perspective on it. But the the nice thing about the science of interstellar is that um, the fi so the Kip Thorne is the physicist who who worked on the movie and who helped develop some of um, helped develop the the special effects model that um, that features in that black hole that you see in the film, um, and and he goes into a lot of some of the the guesswork that they did with regards to the geology and the biology and the planets that feature in the movie, and also the physics um, and some of the astrophysics that went into it. So I think I don't know. I think if someone saw Interstellar and loved it, I think they'd be really interested in getting the science of Interstellar by Kip Thorne. Um, Kip Thorne also wrote another book called Black Holes and Time Warps mm -hmm. that um, that might be sort of a companion book for, mm -hmm. for people who, who like the science of inner stuff. Now, if you're a person who's interested, maybe saw the movie, but you don't have a background in physics or cosmology, is that something? Well, that's the great thing about this particular author because he, he is a popular science writer. Ah. So he's used to writing for non-expert audiences. So I think, I think it'll be... Um, pretty easy to jump in. And mm -hmm. so my next question, I always want to know about the crossover, because that crossed down to teens that might be interested in science or had seen the movie and were fascinated by the subject? Um, I think it would be, I think it's a little bit higher level. Mm -hmm. I, I certainly wouldn't discourage teens from, mm -hmm. from reading it. Um, uh, another, so you mentioned Neil deGrasse Tyson. That mm -hmm. might be a better entry point, someone mm -hmm. who um, especially with the Cosmos series mm -hmm. that was finishing uh, up. That's yeah. a really, that's a really great great 
point. Um, I know Cosmos has a lot of a lot of books out too. Okay. Just perusing the bookstore. Mm -hmm. um, I brought another one um, for. So I have people on my Christmas list who are huge Oppenheimer fans uh -huh. who are really interested in the history of the atomic bomb, mm -hmm. and um, there are some amazing writing about all different aspects of the atomic bomb. I was just started, I was reading Barefoot Jen again just the other day, which is a really powerful graphic novel mm -hmm. um, about the day that the atomic bomb went off in Hiroshima. But, um, but this story is a, uh, called The Girls of Atomic City is by Denise uh, Kierman, and she wrote a very interesting tale. It's, it's not really a triumphant tale, it's really a tale of hardship um, about women who worked on the atomic bomb in World War II. Um, and who did not know they were working on the atomic bomb. Mm. So, um, yeah, there's a really, a really powerful chapter in here uh, toward the end when they, they hear the news and the, and the president's announcing all the work that's been going on in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And they're looking uh. at each other and saying, Oh. Oak Ridge? <laughs> is this Oak Ridge and also out at the desert, Los Alamos, where there are women that are featured in the book that were out there too? Or? This book focuses on Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge in okay. particular. Yeah, and, and the women who worked in various ways on, um, on different aspects mm. of that science. Imagine yeah. it was so compartmentalized that they really didn't have an mm -hmm. idea of the big picture. Mm -hmm. and to find out. Yeah, wow. to find out that way yeah. in the news, uh, yeah. on the news, yeah. Wow. Mm. So, um, so yes, this is the girls of Atomic City. So, mm. um, and the last thing I brought is actually it's a periodical we have. It's a magazine that actually shows up at McGraw. Yep. Um, and it's called Make Magazine, and um, I think this would be a subscription to Make Magazine. It may be a gift certificate to Radio Shack. <laughs> might, yeah. be a great <laughs> 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 might be a great, might be a great gift <laughs> for some of the people you know, especially if you have you know someone who's. Mechanically minded. Mechanically minded. Even someone who, yeah. you know, I'm thinking my, my sister used to used to like to press buttons and, you know, destroy stuff <laughs> things like Take that. Take things apart. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, if you have someone like that in your life, you could probably channel it into something more productive. I'm thinking <laughs> of my brother. <laughs> I'm thinking he's the guy who there is, there's not a mechanical thing in our house that didn't get taken apart and put back together. Mm -hmm. Sometimes not always working. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But this is, I think, uh, Make is a good magazine, both for people who, you know, there are projects in here that, mm -hmm. you know, they have a supply list and you can put together, um, you know, a project that may involve some programming, that may involve um, some, you know, mechanical work, uh, but also just for someone who, uh, there are a lot of interesting articles in here and a lot of buyer's guides and things mm -hmm. like that. So mm -hmm. even if you have someone who's a hobbyist, <laughs> mm -hmm. I think this could be something really nice for them. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. And moving right around the circle, oh I, right. I have been, I have been looking, looking over my after shoulder. <laughs> the books in this pile. I, I lost the picture you found oh, already. Well, but I, oh. think, I think it's one of those things, if you open that book randomly. Yes, it's all, so, they're all oh, beautiful, oh, delicious I'm sorry, things. Introduce so. yourself. Yes, <laughs> I'm Megan Coker, and I'm the curator for the Doris Kirshner Cookbook Collection over in McGraw Library on the St. Paul campus. So, yes, we'll start with this book. Uh, <laughs> so the first book I brought is Vegetable Literacy by Deborah Madison. This was one of last year's James Beard Award winners, and it is gorgeous. Uh, so here's an example of the, the beautiful pictures in here, but I'm, also- I'm hungry already. And yes. I have to wipe the drool. <laughs> and <laughs> Deborah Madison is just, you know, a hugely renowned author of cookbooks. You know, she's been publishing cookbooks for years. Her recipes are, you know, like without a doubt, you know, they always work and they're always delicious. Mm. Um, if any of you know, one of our colleagues always brings these collard greens to some of our staff events and that's a Deborah Madison <gasps> recipe and everyone requests those all the time. Really? Yes. And, oh, and, and that, did that come from this book? No, so that one, if anyone wants to buy me a present, uh, <laughs> Deborah Madison also has a new edition of uh, her Vegetarian Cooking for Everyone out this year. Mm -hmm. So uh, that has, it's an updated version of one of her classic cookbooks that um, if you have any vegetarians or just people who like to cook on your list, they, they probably already have the older edition of that, but the new one has 200 new recipes uh -huh. and 
um, is updated. So that's a great one, and that recipe is in there. So vegetarian <laughs> cooking for everyone. I'm yes. repeating this because I think my Santa needs to get me one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to go to her staff meeting. I know. <laughs> Our staff meetings they don't seem to bring food. Oh, uh -huh. we're having mm. yeah, <coughs> we're having yeah. a whole cookie party in my library oh, today. Wow. Oh. <laughs> oh, we I think we need to travel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the next book I have is Smitten with Squash, and I brought this because it is a local author and it's by the Minnesota Historical Society mm -hmm. Press and I already did a whole there have been a ton of local cookbooks and local authors this year so I've already talked about a bunch of those but this is one that didn't make it because it came out a little later and it's a really great book I've already used it for uh, just you know I have this kind of squash what am I gonna make and it's you know I, I am okay I love I am squash not a squash person so so tell me but you can tell make me Tell me a fabulous, you said you just used it for a recipe. Tell me something I would like to eat that is a squash. Something you would like to eat that is a squash for not a squash lover. Spaghetti, well, you can spaghetti squash. Spaghetti oh, squash. no, don't even start. Ah, it's not <laughs> close to oh. spaghetti. No. Well, no, you don't use it as spaghetti. No. <laughs> Butter, butternut. Squash. There's Good butternut squash. You okay, can make like me. You can like make a pasta sauce out of a squash. If you if you roast it and you know, okay, put, okay, put a roast. lot of roasted garlic okay, in it. Here's my thing about squash. Okay. You have the squash mm -hmm. and it's hard as a rock. Mm -hmm. And then the recipe says cut it up. Yeah, that's the worst. So the the Isn't the crazy? best thing to do with your squash <laughs> is to only do one cut. Just cut it in half. Uh-huh. Like the cover like this, here. yes. Okay. Cut it so in half what like kind this. Of squash is that? That's a butternut. Okay. So then you scoop the seeds out. Uh-huh. You just stick that on a baking sheet in your oven with a little olive oil underneath it. Stick it in there for 45 minutes at, you know, 375. Uh -huh. And then you can scoop your squash out and do stuff with it. You can oh. make a nice soup. You can make a sauce with it. You can okay. bake with it. You know, just puree it a little in your and, food processor. And that would be in this book? Yeah. Okay, so this book would help me be a squash lover. Perhaps. You guarantee. Yes, 100%. 100%. Oh, <laughs> you will love squash with this book. Okay, so All right. so so that's smitten with squash. Smitten Who's with that squash. By? Amanda K. Pa. Amanda K. Pa. I am not going to ask for this for Christmas. All right. I'm still vegetables. What's we'll the try other? some recipes. So okay. vegetable literacy is the vegetable other one. Vegetable literacy. Okay. Yeah, and then the last one I brought is gluten free girl every day, uh. and I brought this because it seems like every other person you meet now is gluten free. So. This has um, this is a cookbook that came that was one of the one of the recent spate of cookbooks based on blogs, ah. and so this was a very popular blog. And then they made this cookbook. It also won a James Beard Award last year. Uh, it's really beautiful. It has super delicious sounding recipes. So if you are throwing a dinner party or having people over to your house or looking for a present for someone who is gluten free, I thought this would be a great choice. Um, because you know it's got new recipes that aren't on the blog, and so and even if they, nice they already read this, look they'll be healthy. Exactly. It doesn't look like, like a, it's a, a medical. <laughs> <laughs> Lure you yes. in with the waffles. Yes. Yes. It doesn't look prescriptive. Lure you in with the waffles, <laughs> biscuits, cookies. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. And um, the ingredients are things you could find in the grocery store. You're not. You're not mail ordering. From Bob's no, Mills, you know, for some of your flowers, I think mm -hmm. uh, if the things like that you're going to be, but you know, like this recipe, for instance, all things you're going to find at any oh, yeah. grocery store. You know, feta cheese, know zucchini, you can do all of this. So that that does look like something I'd have even if I wasn't gluten free. Exactly. I love your collection. Me too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cookbooks. I love cookbooks. I don't cook like people cook but I love reading them mm -hmm. so I'm looking forward to that vegetarian one mm -hmm. now you brought some books too. I brought yeah, too what did you bring books. us <laughs> um, <laughs> as you know I don't I, I, I have trouble selecting so we'll we'll we'll, we'll group them so that I actually have right. three <laughs> um, I'm Lisa Von Drasic. I'm the curator of the children's literature research collections at the University of Minnesota I love saying that all at once because it's such a it rolls off the tongue nicely. It doesn't it? Doesn't mm -hmm. it? There's the short form is I'll just say, oh, I'm your children's librarian. <laughs> Did you know the university had mm -hmm. one? <laughs> so as your children's librarian, I like to choose books to give kids you don't know or families you don't know that well or books that would be universally appreciated. So these count as one. You see how I did that? Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, Tales from the Brothers Grimm. Um, if you're a children's literature person, you do know Lisbeth Swerver. 
Sorver, you know that um, she is an uh, internationally famous illustrator. And what she has done here is retold uh, Hans Christian Andersen tales with beautiful watercolor paintings. Oh. So many of these tales have been told before, but what I love about this is when we're thinking about all the retellings now of children's books um, based on folklore and fairy tales, it seems to me kids and families are skipping the originals, so they don't get the richness of those tales. So if you're reading a retelling by Adam Gidwitz, um, you're not getting the full picture because you hadn't heard the original ones. Um, these, some of these are really dark. And, um, well, I was wondering, do they yeah. keep the original? They keep the original in both of these <laughs> books. This one is Hans Christian Andersen's Fairy Tales, The Illustrated Treasury of, and yes, the match girl does die at the end. Um, and also in the Grimm's fa Tales, the original kind of scary. But do you, do, have you been seeing those trailers for Into the Woods? I mean, <laughs> scary? <laughs> um, and there is a retelling this year, which is remarkable, Hansel and Gretel by Neil Gaiman. Oh. Yeah, Toon Books. Um, it's a whole new uh, series from Toon Books. And the thing about that is there's a video online of Neil Gaiman talking about scary tales, how his graveyard book was criticized for being too scary for children. And he talks about how we need to give the kids these originals, these dark originals, because that's where they get the mastery over that scariness, those scary thoughts. Um, and often the heroine is stronger in the tale. The two children in Hansel and Gretel triumph over the witch. So there is some of that through our own ingenuity. And, and I wasn't even thinking about this, but it was just recently, that you think about when they talk about the prince always saving the princess in Hansel and Gretel, it's the clever girl who saves her brother from the witch. Um, so these are dark tales, but I think they're okay for the holiday season. They're gorgeously illustrated. They're, they're books that um, would make terrific gifts. Um, and I started rereading them because they were around, and I remember loving these tales. And they're also great at the end of a long day, so a family can get together and read aloud. As you know, I'm a huge proponent for reading aloud to all ages. <laughs> so after Grimm and Anderson, what else have you got in oh. your little stack of delights there? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a time of year when awards are coming out and people are mm -hmm. saying, what do you think's going to win the call to cut? What do you think's going <coughs> to... And you know, for me, I never pick it right. <laughs> but there is the right word. This is one of the most fascinating picture books that I think for all ages. The right, ro the right word, Roger and his thesaurus, Jen Bryant, illustrated by Melissa Sweet. So in this one volume, look at these end papers. In this Ooh. one volume, you see all the research that goes in to creating a biography. You see the beauty of the word, the beauty of the letters. Melissa Sweet, who brought us Balloons Over Broadway, which is the invention of the balloons that for the Macy mm -hmm. Thanksgiving oh. Parade is one of my favorite books of the last 10 years. The man is not wholly evil. He has a thesaurus in his cabin. And that's J.M. Barry, author <laughs> of Peter Pan, describing the character Captain Hook. <laughs> so we think, what is a thesaurus? It's a list of words that all mean the same thing. And choosing the right word and how hard that is, you think you always had that ability to look it up. Kids look it up online, but there was a boy named Peter Mark Roger, pronounced Roger. See how that is? We love the picture books. 1779 born, beginning, born. So that's the word. Beginning, baby, infant, tadpole, child, youth, lad, <laughs> youngster, whippersnapper, student, adolescent, teen scholar, grown-up, manhood, 
and his list of words and how he became the person who was interested in that. It seems mm. like this would be a good book for people who liked um, The Professor and the Madman. Oh, yes! By Simon, by Simon Winchester, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think of this as a crossover. This is a beautiful book for grown-ups. It's a beautiful book for kids. And I, I can't think of someone I wouldn't want to give this to. I, I would give this to someone in this room right now, but this one has already been signed for mm. Christmas for someone, so. <laughs> so. <laughs> Sorry. If I could only pick one book to give this season, this would be the one. Um, and it, you're pronouncing it again. And I'm pronouncing it, I'm not pronouncing it. Animalium. You wanna give it a go? Uh, that works for me. A animalium. Animalium. An an Animalium. 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 There was a book called Animalia a couple years ago by Doug Florian. Do you know that? It's a book of poetry. I gave that to everyone. <laughs> um, so back to this one. Um, this is curated by Katie Scott and Jenny Broom. Welcome to the museum. It truly is a physical museum of natural history. And again, randomly opening, it's one of those books that you can randomly open to any part. Reptiles, Gallery 4. <sighs> These are exquisite, accurate illustrations. So we have the Gila Monster, we have okay. Turtles and Tortoise. Um, I was trying to think of a kid I wouldn't want to give it to. I would want to give it to the kid who loves art. I would want to give it to the kid who loves nature. I would want to give it to the grown-up who wants to lay on the floor. Can you just imagine a family laying on the floor and paging through this and reading and sharing? Have you ever seen a flamingo? Have you ever seen a flamingo? I actually saw one last week at the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what do you know about flamingos? Not a lot. Not a lot. So wouldn't this be a perfect time to explore about the flamingo? The American flamingo, the height is 43 inches. How big is that? 43 inches. The flamingo buries its head to feed, sucking and filtering mud with its beak. So you have odd, odd snippets of information as if you were walking through a museum of natural history and just seeing the labels. Wow, there's that mm -hmm. snow owl. Mm -hmm. I heard an owl the other morning. You got did. Out of my car. <laughs> and I can see this. This would be a great book to grow up with too. Like oh. I can think, you know, my daughter's super young right now, but she would just love looking at these pictures. She loves to make all the animal noises and growing up, then getting more and more of the layers of it. And I would love this book too. I remember as a kid, I had a book about seashells, and I, I was an encyclopedia of seashells by the end of this. And with a book like this, yeah, you know, you could have someone <sighs> who knows every animal that walks or crawls on the oh. earth. <laughs> and that's the other thing I really like about this is the attention to detail. So you can pour. Oh, this reminded me of a visit to mm -hmm. aquarium, where I first saw. Is that a stingray? I think so. Um, and, and, and you can actually see on the page the way they float silently on the bottom of the ocean and the colors, how they blend into the mud on the floor. So you're not only bringing your personal, inf look at that <laughs> cross section. That's, <laughs> what I really like. There's That's fantastic. Not that there are boy or girl books, but I do love this cross section. <laughs> Uh, you need a bigger boat. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, very cool. So very cool. Yeah. So this is this is. Um, if I was going to pick one book for a gift this year, this is the one. That's the one. That's right. the one. Thank you for joining us for read this book.